Hi everyone, I'm Dan Jones. Welcome to Interchange and thank you so very much for joining us. Interesting stuff to talk about tonight. The capture and killing of Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi. We'll talk about a warning to state agencies from the Walker administration that they should get ready for the possibility of even more budget cuts. We'll talk about the possibility of state law changing once again so that public schools could teach abstinence only sex education classes. And we'll talk about Milwaukee Police Chief Ed Flynn getting a new contract, which will keep him around in Milwaukee for another four years. All right, let's introduce everybody. We have newspaper columnist Joel McNally. We have Kevin Fisher, longtime broadcaster, political analyst, and oftentimes a fill-in host over on WISN Talk Radio. Denise Calloway is the <laughs> coordinator of business and community partnerships for the Milwaukee Public School System. And Gerard Randall, education consultant and local job creation expert. Rick Horowitz will be along with commentary at the end of the show. All right, let's talk for just a few minutes about the capture and killing of Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi, one of the most brutal and certainly one of the oddest dictators in the world. I find it fascinating how someone so strange and so mean can hold on to power for 40 years, but I guess if you control the military, that probably guarantees you control the country. And therein lies the problem with transitioning <clears throat> from his reign to um, what will hopefully be a democracy that... Uh, takes into account the, um, uh, that, that country's position in the rest of the world. <clears throat> it has uh, not been accustomed to having representative government, uh, certainly not true representative government. They do sit on top of uh, considerable wealth because of its, its oil. Uh, they haven't played a significant role in the world economy outside of its, its, uh, its oil. And uh, as a result, I think uh, many people have been reluctant to deal with Gaddafi other than the fact that they needed, they needed oil. So now this new government will have to be uh, responsive to the desires of its people that will suddenly uh, want to have more say in how they are governed. Uh, they will have to figure out how to control that economy, which uh, has been somewhat lopsided. And they have a, a role to play in the rest of uh, the world's governments, with the rest of the world's governments, and trying to keep some type of stability in that region, in the Middle East region. Okay, Kevin, so you have Gaddafi gone, uh, Osama bin Laden is gone. Today, Barack Obama announces that, okay, all the troops are going to be out of Iraq by the end of the year. Do all these things combined help him in his reelection effort? Um, it depends on whether or not you think that the United States is safer now as a result of what happened. Not, not, not necessarily. Uh, I think it's, uh, this is obviously a very significant event, mm -hmm. and the Libyan people, more than anybody, are now freer and, and, and safer. Uh, but you have <clears throat> uh, a, thousands, maybe tens of thousands, of Libyan uh, surface-to-air missiles are missing. Nobody knows where they are. And now you're going to bring all the troops out of Iraq. You're going to bring them home, which means that there are, uh, there's going to be a greater presence now of the opposition in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, will, will terrorists, knowing that we have a soft U.S.-Mexico border, work with Mexican drug cartels to try to get missiles into our country uh, uh, through, through, through the border? Um, uh, you know, while there's a lot of celebrating... I'm not so sure that this necessarily makes the United States safer. Denise, I was kind of uh, surprised and somewhat troubled by the incredible graphic photos that, that were in every newspaper, on every TV station of, of Gaddafi's capture and death. I mean, when did we get to the point where this was acceptable? Well, I, I think a couple of things have happened. First, this is an individual who was so hated not only in Libya, but around the world. And, and let's take a look at what's happened in Arab countries um, since the um, beginning of the Arab Spring. You know, Gaddafi is really the last dictator to fall. And, and I think that symbolically, as much as in reality, he represents so much of, of the way that this, this Middle Eastern area um, has changed. Um, and it's such a relatively short period of time and a part of the region of the world that is so very old. The, the other thing I think we have to take a look at, and I'm, I, I, I'm going to answer the question you asked Kevin about how this helps the president. I think it helps him tremendously. He's kept the promise that he made to bring those troops home. 
That is going to happen. That was a campaign promise that he fulfilled. And he does it in a way in which that whole region has been transformed, where we've pulled the cover back on Pakistan to talk about what's really happening in Pakistan. Osama bin Laden is gone. Gaddafi is gone. The, the two kind of evil guys in the Middle East both have been found out, captured, and brought to some kind of justice through their deaths under his watch. That helps to make this country safer. I mean, I'm not going to speculate about what might happen about some missiles that may or may not be missing and whether or not people are going to kind of going to. Um, uh, somehow connect with the drug cartels in Mexico. Mexico's got its own problems. There are its own issues that we need to, just as we did throughout the Middle East, <coughs> work with the countries that are having trouble to figure out ways in which to improve that. I think that this president has done a tremendous job to help change and now stabilize a part of the world that for, for decades has really been a concern not only for the United States in terms of, of stability and safety, but the rest of the world. Does it help his campaign? Well, of course it does. Uh, look at what really happened. I mean, to me, it is amazing. Um, rather than starting a third war, when we had two wars already going from the last president that they couldn't figure out how to end, you know, after eight years, uh, and now he's finally ending one of them at the end of this year, uh, he got Osama bin Laden that, that George Bush was looking for for eight years and couldn't do anything about. Uh, but what happened in Libya, we went in there with partners. It wasn't like the rest of the world against the United States, the way Iraq was. Uh, it was going in there with you know, our allies and not a single American life was lost and, and basically that government was toppled and, and the dictator is gone. Uh, and to me, that is leadership. That is world leadership and it shows the difference between going up against the world as the last president did, and working with our allies to accomplish great things. All right, next topic. The State Department of Administration here in Wisconsin has told a number of state agencies to prepare for the possibility of even more budget cuts than were laid out when the budget was passed last summer. They're being told the economy is down, tax collections are down, so the money might not just be there. Already, the UW system is complaining that it cannot handle any more cuts. But is the Walker administration simply being prudent, saying, hey, uh, I know we promised this, but if the money's not there, you got to get ready? Well, but I think that was the caveat that was in the budget all along. No one ever said that if you do this, absolutely this is going to happen. Uh, those state agencies were told that uh, if the tax collections uh, came in as they were anticipated to come in, uh, that that would mean a balanced budget following all of the rest of the plan. On the other hand, if it didn't come in as planned, then you needed to be prepared to address those budget shortfalls and come in with a budget that would then help to balance this budget for the second half of the biennium. Let's look at those some of those realities in that budget that are going to be pretty tough and where uh, I think there's going to be some, 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 some outcry. Uh, the UW's budget, uh, already they are undergoing uh, uh, an examination to determine whether or not their governance structure is the right structure. And this will put some additional pressure on the legislature to take a look at how can that system operate more effectively. You can't continue to pass your budget shortfalls back onto uh, families that are, are, are looking to get their college degrees at an ever escalating cost. The other big piece is going to be around the cost of health care. And I do believe that uh, if that piece of it can be addressed, can be fixed, um, then you're not going to see these tremendous increases in deficits uh, that we've been seeing over the last few years. Denise, every time you see this headline, though, where UW is complaining about budget cuts, you know that tuition is going to go up. Uh, believe me, I know it because I pay for it at <laughs> UW-Madison. I pay for it at UWM. So, I mean, I, I think the UW system has a right to be concerned. I think we should all be concerned about that because Gerard touched very rightly on the fact that as college costs continue to escalate, at a time when the economy is down and families are able to do less and less for students, um, it, it makes... 
it makes it very difficult for families to be able to afford college educations at the great institutions that we have in the state, not only UW-Madison and UWM, but throughout the UW system. But it becomes harder and harder for that to happen. And the other impact that it has on our economy um, in the long term is that students now, are more and more students are forced to take out more and more loans. Well, what does that mean for these students? They graduate with tremendous debt. And as they're graduating with this debt in a down economy, where if they find a job, they're not making as much money as they plan to, they've got to pay back these loans. So what does that mean that they're not doing? They're not doing things where they're purchasing items that help to stimulate the economy, create the jobs that the governor wants to create. Um, it, it, to me, we, we have to take a look at, at how this impacts particularly the UW system because the potential harm that it does to this state short term in terms of raising costs for kids, long term in terms of not really having a system that's able to meet and respond to the needs we have in this state, <clears throat> it is tremendous and that's a job killer. So if the state doesn't have the money and raising tuition is not the answer, where does the money come from? Uh, <laughs> Boy, if this governor were serious about creating jobs, and he, he's now claimed that we were having two legislative sessions about creating jobs, so far all I've seen out of these legislative sessions is giveaways of hundreds of millions of dollars to corporations and to the people who contributed to his campaign. If he wanted to create jobs, you certainly would not make the university system the number one target to gut. Neither would you make secondary education uh, your other target. So far, his so-called job session have destroyed jobs for teachers, cut money to school districts all over this state, and now he's targeting the UW system. If you want to create jobs in this state, you want higher education. You want well-educated people getting good jobs and being qualified for good jobs and raising the economy. Uh, you can take some of that money he's giving away to all of his contributors and give it to the UW system, put it into the UW system where it does raise the economy. It does raise, raise jobs in this state. Make this a real job session instead of gutting another institution, uh, which you know is going to hurt the economy and hurt jobs rather than create jobs. So where does the money come from, Kevin, then? If you, if you can't cut the Take secondary the schools the and the primary schools and you can't cut colleges, technical schools or the I'll university system. it's not coming from. It's not coming from the people who pay the bills because they, 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 they just can't continue to keep paying and paying and paying. The money's not there. This isn't really a, a shattering news bulletin here. The, the nonpartisan legislative fiscal bureau led by Bob Lang and his team, and they're the best in the country, are constantly crunching the numbers and looking at how much tax revenue is coming in. And it's just not there. And he, he gives that information to every single legislature, legislator, to the governor. And I think it is very prudent and wise for the governor to say, look, here's what we know. Here's what we know is coming in. Here's what we know is not coming in. We have to adjust. Here's what could possibly happen. Be prepared because there could be come the day where we, in the biennium now, mm -hmm. we may have to call the legislature in and, and, and do a budget adjustment yes. bill because we're not, get, we're not having the intake that we thought was coming in. I don't think there should be a tuition increase, but I certainly don't think there should be a ma major tax increase either. The answer that no one wants not to give you is, is you is you have to live within your means. And this governor is not only saying that to the, to the to UW, he's saying it to all state agencies that this might be coming down the road, that, the, that we may have to see some cuts. We may not see the cuts, but based on what we know about the revenue coming in, it doesn't look good. All right, let's stay in Madison for just a few minutes. When the Democrats controlled the state legislature, they passed a law which prohibited schools from offering abstinence-only sex education curriculums. They had to offer comprehensive courses. Now that the Republicans are in charge, there's a move to once again allow schools to teach abstinence-only courses and to require all courses to promote marriage. Is this the way it should be? or is this being going back in the 1950s? It's irresponsible. It's irresponsible. Uh, passing the comprehensive sex education 
uh, law was was sensible legislation because uh, if you're going to teach sex, sex education, it certainly should be comprehensive. It certainly shouldn't try to scare young people out of using condoms or out of using birth control. Uh, that is a you know that's not anything that any sensible sane person wants. And to me, it, it is just amazing that Republicans who claim to be anti-abortion would be also be anti condoms and anti-birth control. Uh, believe me, uh, you know, do you want a 14-year-old girl to, to have to face this abortion uh, that you don't want her to have? Or do you want her to have that child? Or do you want her you know, to practice safe sex if she gets into sex? I mean, you can tell kids, and I've said this over and over, throughout our history, Adults have tried to explain to kids that they should not engage in sex. And every single young person in America has discovered at one time or another that they're rather attracted to the idea. And the best thing we can do is, is teach responsible sex education in our schools and certainly not distort the curriculum and try to scare kids out of practicing safe sex. As a parent, Denise, though, do you think schools should should at least touch on, hey, don't have any sex at all, wait until you're older, wait until you're an adult. Well, that's what comprehensive plans do. Um, and and that's, that's, those are the ones that are the most effective. And we're not guessing about this. We have an example right here in our own backyard in Milwaukee. When you take a look at what the United Way and a number of its partners have been able to do, developing a comprehensive plan and using a comprehensive sex education plan to talk to kids about sex, including the discussion of abstinence, but that's not the only thing they talk about. That comprehensive approach has seen the percentage of teen births drop dramatically. So we've got a model that we know works. You know, it, it's not something that's happened in some other city or state. It's right here in Milwaukee where we've had the highest teen pregnancy <coughs> rates in the state where we've seen a comprehensive approach make a difference and reduce the number of teen pregnancies. Rather than going back and trying to, to, to reenact something that was not successful, we should be able to stick with a program that works. Kevin, I've heard you say in the past, uh, what's wrong with teaching abstinence only because it is the only method that's 100% effective? Abstinence is the best and uh, the only 100% effective method if you want to stop kids from it fails from more having often sex. than contraception. Well, abstinence never fails. If you're abstinent, you're never <laughs> no, going to you're never believe, going to believe, you're never going to get pregnant. Kids stop being abstinent, it has failed. Well, there's a lot of misconception about this bill. It is very similar to one that Jim Doyle signed into law back around 2005, but then he later signed a repeal of that very very same law. A, a, a great deal of misinformation has been spouted right on this program about this bill. All it does is it shifts responsibility for shaping sex ed curriculum from the state, from a bureaucrat in a cubicle in the state. It takes all of those rules and regulations and says local school districts should be making these decisions. If they want comprehensive, they can have comprehensive. It's just that they do have to stress and emphasize that abstinence is, and it's undeniable, is the best <laughs> and the only 100% way to prevent teen pregnancy and to stop the explosion of sexually transmitted diseases, which is happening all across the country. When, when people say the state shouldn't be involved in, in sex education courses, the state's involved in a lot of educational aspects of education in the, in the secondary schools, though. Well, and, and, and for some, that's a rub. Uh, they would prefer that the state leave those decisions to local communities. And that's what this Particularly bill is given you've got all these local school boards that have that responsibility for deciding in those schools what they should have. And what if those local school have. boards decide to go for ignorance? Well, you know, they, they're elected, you unelect them. Uh, if, if, if people in that community are finding dissatisfaction with their leadership on these boards, uh, they can get rid of them. And, it's as simple the meantime, as that. The kids have suffered. Well, I don't know that I don't that's going to be the who case. Have sex right. suffers. The, the, it's, you it's know, not, one, it's in, in, in Africa, one sex. of the things that's that the impressed me was yeah. you had uh, a program called ABCs, and the ABC stressed abstinence, use of condoms, and uh, making sure that. Uh, these families were always looking out for uh, those situations that they would 
get themselves into uh, where they would be uh, uh, taken advantage of because you had a lot of young girls that because of local tribal customs were being taken advantage of. This program reminds me of that. It's comprehensive, but abstinence is a key part of that. All right, next topic. Milwaukee gave Police Chief Ed Flynn a new contract last night, keeping him around for another four years. Under Flynn, crime rates have gone down consistently in Milwaukee, but there have been a great many complaints about longer waiting times when you call 911 and you need a cop right now. Is he still the right guy for this time and this city? Uh, I don't know that there have been a lot of complaints about that waiting time. There's been a, a, a campaign in, in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel about it uh, that point to longer times. And But, uh, you know, the truth of the matter is uh, a, when you call for a police officer, unless you're in the midst of a situation that police officer can stop, which is a very rare situation, uh, there's nothing that police officer is going to be able to do uh, depending on whether he gets there, you know, 20 minutes afterwards or, or 40 minutes afterwards. Uh, you know, the crime is over. Uh, when the police are called. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, you know, this chief has pointed out, is because of the way we use our police officers now, putting them into areas where they're needed to prevent crime rather than, you know, always being, you know, ready to, you know, leap out and, and, and be there a little quicker, you know, after the crime is already over, uh, that, that is the reason he points to his statistics about crime going on. On the surface, that sounds good, but you bring up the Journal Sentinel and their their, their reports and others have done it this week uh, and it's pretty damning I think to the Milwaukee Police Department I've lived in Milwaukee my entire life and I've never read a sentence in the paper so alarming as that when you call 911 uh, people are being told that you can expect to be put on hold for 15 minutes to an hour for 911 that's not acceptable this is a chief who is obsessed with data he's got the data to back him up uh, and he has a mayor that is very supportive. But that, to me, th those response times, especially 911, to be told you might have to wait an hour, there is no way to excuse that. But, but you, know, you, yeah, you that, can't the, afford to double the size of the he, police department. You can't though. afford to double the size of the police department. And, you know, he's you were willing to he is data, he he is data driven. Well, the sheriff's department doesn't do any of that stuff. So oh, they data. handle 111,000 the calls the data, a year. It makes a huge <laughs> difference. In terms, and you know what most of those calls are, many of those calls are 911 calls from cell phones on the highway. Now let's go back to the real oh, issue we that we're want talking to respond about to here, those? Okay. which really is the, the sheriff's case in charge of those 911 calls. What happens in this city when you have someone who pays attention to what the data is telling you rather than the rattling noise, and he has paid attention to the data? What's happened is we we have seen much more effective p policing. We've seen reductions in violent crimes, those crimes that change and threaten people's lives. He's done a great job of doing this. Ask people if they feel safer in this city. I, I, I ask, live in the city. A lot of people do. I live in the ask city. Them. I live in the Sherman Park community. I absolutely feel safer. And ask them if, if they're happy officer. with uh, calling 911 and being blown off. All right, let's turn to presidential politics for just a minute. We know who the incumbent is, and we know who the candidates are who are trying to unseat him. But what we still don't know is which states will be voting when to pick that Republican nominee. Luckily, Rick Horowitz is here to try to unravel some of the confusion. Rick. Hey, New Hampshire, you've got a problem. Everyone wants a piece of you, a piece of your presidential nominating chops. You've got the first in the nation primaries. You've had them for generations. You and Iowa with their first in the nation caucuses, the two of you pretty much get to play presidential kingmaker. Iowa first, generally, and then you follow a week or so later. And then there's another week before any other state's allowed to do anything. It's New Hampshire law to keep those other states from sucking away any of that great New Hampshire momentum. But leave it to Florida to make trouble. Florida decided a while back to move its primary from sometime in March to the last day of January, which made South Carolina, which loves being the first in the South primary, move its date from February to January 21. Meanwhile, Nevada decided to move up its caucuses, too, to January 14 which put the pressure on Iowa, <laughs> remember Iowa, to move its caucuses even earlier. And it did, all the way to January 3rd. So if Iowa's January 3rd and Nevada is January 14, then New Hampshire is screwed. <laughs> the only Tuesday available, and you guys always vote on Tuesday, right, is January 10. But then you lose that nice seven-day window afterward, which is why you've been threatening lately to hold your primary in December, this December of 2011. That'll show them. 
unless of course somebody decides to show you, what if somebody schedules their own vote even earlier in December? Or what if somebody else decides to leapfrog all of you and choose November? There's really only one thing to do. You have to have a meeting tonight, if possible, and decide to schedule the New Hampshire primary yesterday. That's right, yesterday. Or the day before yesterday, just to play it safe. If it's already happened, then they can't go ahead of you, right? Sure, it could cause some logistical headaches, counting up the votes, for instance, figuring out who won. But wouldn't it be worth it to protect what really matters, little New Hampshire's giant-sized influence? And by taking a stand, you'd be living up to New Hampshire's sacred principles. No, not live free or die. That's the official motto. I'm talking about your unofficial motto. Yeah, 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 yeah. Rick, and thank you so very much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.